from enslavement in ancient Greek and Latin novels. I believe we're up and running. Uh, Christian, can you confirm? Beautiful. We're up. We're good. All right. Chris, talk. <laughs> All right, thank you uh, very much. Let me see how this works. Up here. Right. Can everyone hear me? Key. Okay, press a key. I'll press a key. There. All right, so I'd like to start the discussion um, with a passage from E.M. Forster's Maurice that I really like. This is one of the sort of great early gay novels in the English literature uh, tradition. In this passage, the main character, Maurice, and his close friend, Durham are in their Greek class and says, towards the end of term, they touched upon a yet more delicate subject. They attended the Dean's translation class. And when one of the men was forging quietly ahead, Mr. Cornwallis observed in a flat toneless voice, omit a reference to the unspeakable vice of the Greeks. I always hear that in Professor Snape's voice. <laughs> Durham observed afterwards that he ought to lose his fellowship for such hypocrisy. Murray Slap. I regard it as a point of pure scholarship. The Greeks, or most of them, were that way inclined, and to omit it is to omit the mainstay of Athenian society. Is that so? You've read the symposium? Maurice had not, and did not add that he had explored Marshall. It's all in there. Not meat for babes, of course, but you ought to read it. Read it this fake. So uh, we are at a conference about inclusion, um, but on this last day, Miriam and I are going to reflect on its opposites, exclusion, and more importantly, omission. So what do I mean by this difference? Exclusion, uh, which is what Mr. Cornwallis does, despite his terminology, leaves marks. Um, exclusion erases and leaves the erasure visible for everyone to see. Omission, however, simply leaves something out. It constructs a new reality in which the omitted thing was never there to begin with. Omission and exclusion are unavoidable aspects of teaching classical texts, as we discover any time that we write a syllabus or try to select texts for a class. But of course, as any student with a marginalized identity knows all too well, what is omitted is often precisely those parts of the classical corpus that are particularly important to our own interests and identities. So in this session, Miriam and I are going to present a few examples from our own work and our own experience as queer classicists. I'm going to talk about Petronius and Miriam will talk about Sappho um, as a way to frame the problem of excerpting and omission in classical pedagogy. And then we'll have a productive conversation that we hope will nicely tie together some of the themes of this weekend. But first, two important disclaimers. We're going to outline a problem, but I don't think we have a solution. Um, the second, is we will be referencing contemporary published pedagogical materials, and we want to be very clear that we do not intend any criticism of these books to be criticism of their authors. Um, we understand that inclusion can be very difficult and hard. Um, also, a warning, I will be showing and discussing Latin texts that describe rape uh, and other forms of sexual violence, but I will not read those texts out loud. Um, so do with that what you will. Okay, so Petronius. Petronius Satirica is a gay classic, despite the valiant efforts of the academic classics world to de-homosexualize it. Homosexuality, we are constantly told, is a modern concept that we should not apply to the ancient world. The basic plot, for those who are not familiar with the text, is that the protagonist, named Encopius, loves a boy named Giton. He and Giton are driven around the Roman world on various wild adventures usually joined by a third character who forms a menage a trois. There is a lot of sex, every kind of sex, heterosexual, homosexual, boring sex, kinky sex, consensual sex, and we should acknowledge a discomfortingly large amount of non-consensual sex and sexual violence. Gay classical reception has often been a project of legitimization, and Petronius has played a unique role in that project. Unlike that other great object of gay reception, Plato's Symposium, which legitimizes homoromantic relationships in the higher service of philosophy, Petronius has been used to legitimize gay sex. This text, as an anthem of sexual liberation stamped with the authority of classical antiquity, 
and we can and should, of course, complicate every word I just said, <laughs> um, has been important to the creation of at least elite gay identity in the modern world. Um, Helen Morales wrote the go-to chapter on this, which I highly recommend to anyone, but I'll give you just a few examples. In 1902, a translation of per appeared spuriously under the name of Sebastian Nelma, which for those who are not familiar with that name was Oscar Wilde's pen name. This was the first translation in English to include all of the sexual scenes. But the 1960s are really the center of gay reception of Petronius. In 1965, two translations of Petronius were published. One was the very scholarly Penguin translation of J.P. Sullivan, um, one of the first scholars to write about sexuality in Petronius. The other was Paul Gillette's more creative and more pornographic interpretation, which was originally partially published in the great classics journal Playboy, called the Satyricon <laughs> Memoirs of a Lusty Roman, along with Federico Fellini's uh, film version from 1968, with which the Gillette's book was later co-branded. Gillette's translation firmly established Petronius as the ancient voice of sexual freedom. Um, I'll quickly mention two more of my favorite examples of Petronian reception. Since I'm from Louisiana and we're in the middle of Mardi Gras season, I can't not mention that the second oldest uh, gay Mardi Gras crew, the crew of Petronius, founded in 1961 and still going strong. Um, and another one of my favorites is this uh, high-end designer underwear store in Paris called Patron. Um, there's a, a blog post on their website where they explain why they chose this name with, of course, the image from Fellini's film. Um, Petronius, however, did not just shape gay history. Gay history has shaped Petronius. The text exists only in fragments, except for the Cana Trimalchionis, which survives separately in a single manuscript. The extant fragments all derive from two different sets of intentional excerpts made in France in the ninth century, called the O and L traditions. In the medieval and Renaissance periods, the O tradition, which was made in the monastery of Auger, was the most widely available version of the text. One of the principles guiding the monks seems to have been the exclusion of the most explicit sexual passages. Compared to the L tradition, where they overlap in the narrative, the O excerpts clearly cut out the most objectionable sex scenes. At times, however, the target seems to be specifically homosexual content. For example, during the orgy led by the priestess of Priapus, Cortilla, a canitis bursts in and assaults Inculpius and Ascultus. That's the first part of the text. This part of the text is found only in the L tradition. The O tradition joins in with the L tradition precisely at the moment that Cortilla turns her attention from the canitis rape of Ascultus to notice Gitan and propose that he have sex with a young enslaved girl named Panukis. The voyeuristic forced rape of the young girl was apparently acceptable to the monks of Auger, but not the canitis rape of Encolpius and Scoltus. Petronius, then, is particularly useful for thinking about the effects of omission and selection, because the text as we have it is entirely a product of these processes. The fragmentation of the already fragmented satirica continues today. A couple years ago, I was asked to help judge a high school essay contest. Um, students in this contest were asked to pick a favorite passage from a classical author and explain why it's interesting. In several of the submissions from multiple schools, I should say, students chose a text which they called The Millionaire's Dinner Party. That is the title of an abridged version of the Cana designed as a graded reader for British schoolboys by Maurice Baum. This version of the text as the name implies, cuts out every part of the novel except for the cana, and as a consequence, cuts out the vast majority of the gay content. But Baum goes further. He has even removed all reference to homoeroticism from the cana itself. Trimalchio's Kikaro, his enslaved boy toy, is entirely gone, as is Trimalchio's own poignant description of how he had won his enslaver's favor by serving as a Kikaro himself. Beth Severy Hoven, the author of a, a recent new intermediate reader that attempts to preserve the sexual and homosexual content of the novel, um, describes her experience of reading Baum's text this way. I did not press the right button. There it is. 
I finally became exasperated with the degree to which Baum modifies the original Latin text to make it both easier for beginning students and more appropriate for the British schoolboys for whom his book was originally intended. For example, most sexual references are eliminated. It is clear, however, that the target of the sanitizing agenda was not just sexual reference in general. In Petronius, I'll give one example. In Petronius' version, Trimalchio kisses one of his male enslaved attendants. Um, bold is not showing up that well. It's the cum puer non inspectusus in process, um, which angers his wife Fortunata, who then calls him a bitch, Canis. Baum's version skips over this detail and offers no explanation other than drunkenness for why Fortunata calls Trimalchio a bitch. Another incident involving Fortunata, however, survives Baum's chopping block. A little bit earlier in both texts, Trimalchio's best bud, Habinus, assaults Fortunata. Um, I'll let you read that yourself if you want to. Not all sexual references then were eliminated. A man sexually assaulting a woman is fair game for British schoolboys, but the gay kiss, which admittedly in this example is also sexual assault, is too much. What particularly struck me about the high school essays, however, was not that the students were reading an abridged and unqueered version of Petronius. That I expect. It was that they seemed to have no idea that what they were reading was an abridged and unqueered version. For them, there was no larger satirica from which they were reading curated selections. There was only the millionaire's dinner party. So Baum's omissions are sort of direct violence towards the text, but there's another far more common type of omission that happens in the interpretation and commentary that we provide for students. Another reader by Gilbert Lowell um, does keep Trimalchio's Kikaro um, and the Speciosus Puer in the Cana, although he still cuts out all of the homoerotic passages from outside the Cana. Yet, Although Lowell's text preserves the sexual content, his commentary and notes minimize it, except for a few stray references to a, quote, boy toy, usually in definitions of delicii, and one mention of Gitan as a, quote, boyfriend in the introduction, there is no explicit discussion of homosexuality or homoeroticism. A student of Lowell's reader would never know that Petronius could be a gay classic. The most Personal example of this kind of omission to me has to do with Catullus 50. Um, in this poem, Catullus writes to his friend Licinius and says that he came home from playing um, at poetry at his house yesterday and couldn't sleep all night because of the intense desire he felt to speak with and be together with Licinius. I vividly remember a conversation I had with a close friend my freshman year of college. Um, my friend's another fabulously gay classicist. Um, and he said that Catullus 50 was one of his favorite poems. And I said, you know, I never understood it. Why can't he sleep? And my friend said, wait, you didn't realize the poem is a beautiful description of homoerotic desire? Well, I had never realized that. Um, <laughs> but why had I not realized that? I think it's because of the pedagogical environment in which I first read it. To give you an example of how this poem is often described in readers, and this is just one example, um, aimed at high school students, here's how a one recent book introduces the text. The activity and Catullus' reaction to it has struck some readers as strange, but those who have engaged in a creative activity with a close friend <laughs> will understand. Creative activity with a close friend is now going to be my new favorite euphemism. <laughs> So omission happens for a variety of reasons. Um, for Baum and Lowell, I'm sure they were both writing in the 70s. It seems that the particular social constraints of the pedagogical environment probably forced the omission, whether they wanted to or not. Um, in the case of Catullus 50, I'm sure many authors of commentaries and teachers in the classroom simply don't see the homoeroticism because they aren't looking for it. Omission, however, is a necessary part of teaching because time is limited, our resources are limited, and we ourselves are limited in our own experiences. Yet, like Trimalchio's dinner guests, who only see masterfully plated dishes and not the raw ingredients in the kitchen, our students do not see the violence that we do to text every day in our lesson plan. Until they become independent readers, they only see what we present. We construct what classics is for them. And if we only show them the millionaire's dinner party, then that is Petronius. 
So this is the ethical problem. How do I choose and present selections of text in a responsible way? What can I omit? It's a problem that defies easy solutions. Among the many books that Baum published in his career is a reader called On the Margins, containing texts about marginal groups in antiquity. This kind of project is very useful and it's a good first step. Um, Bocasi Carducci, the publisher, now has an entire series of readers like this, including a wonderful uh, Roman women reader that I've been looking at recently by Sheila Dickinson and Judith Hallett. Um, but as I was preparing for this conference, I was struck by the title Balm Chose, because in a sense, on the margins is what these readers do. They're so useful because they collect text together, but that very collection marks them as marginal. Petronius, however, has been so important for gay reception precisely because it is not a marginal text or not an entirely marginal text. It's a text that Maurice and Durham might have read in their boarding school Latin classes. The last unsettling thought I'll leave you with before we hear from Miriam is this. It's not difficult for me to make sure that my text selections include material that speaks to queer students, but what about the other identities and orientations of reception that my students have? How can I even know what important material I have omitted. Um, and with that, we'll hear from Miriam. Thanks, Chris. So off next, Miriam Camel, Chris's colleague at Harvard. She's a fifth year PhD candidate in classical philology, as they call it, up there. <laughs> uh, and she studies, among other things, gender and sexuality. Thank you, and thank you, Chris, for that excellent talk, Mr. Trillius. Uh, before we launch into uh, a, what I'm sure will be a great discussion together, uh, I want to give everyone one more example of, of this sort of thing. Uh, I'm going to talk about Sappho. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Uh, the story of Sappho's evolution in classical scholarship is extensive and dramatic, as the great gaps in our knowledge about the poet's life and the gaps even in the poetry itself have allowed people to project their personal desires and agendas onto the name Sappho. In the face of centuries of turf wars over Sappho's name and reputation, I focus in this talk on one representative slice of the tug of war between scholars and educated non-specialists over the fraught issue of Sappho's sexuality. In fact, just about a century ago, there erupted a heated feud between the censorious classic scholars uh, who viewed Sappho as a model of chastity and those first outside the academy, then increasingly within it, who read something more subversive into Sappho's writings. Echoes of both sides can be found in Sappho scholarship today, which leaves us with the question of how to bear our scholarly inheritance. Among the most significant and enduring pieces of Sappho scholarship is the 1913 commentary called Sappho und Simonides by Ulrich von Willemowitz Mullendorf. Uh, a German scholar following in the wake of the founders of modern philology, Willemowitz carried the burden of cementing the bounds of a still somewhat nebulous discipline. In this spirit, a disproportionately large portion of his book is devoted to debunking the increasingly popular notion of a homoerotic Sappho. For after centuries of whispered speculation and salacious literary distortions, the public had come to connect the concept of lesbianism, as in female homosexuality, with Sappho of Lesbos. Enter Villamovitz, who says in his book, whoever associates lesbiazine with love between girls should refer to the lexicon. Sappho has nothing to do with it. Above all, it, referring to love between girls, has always been considered an aberration, an exception, almost a monstrosity. Uh, and for the word for monstrosity here, he opts for the ancient Greek teros, because apparently German didn't have anything strong enough to get his point across. <laughs> uh, and now Sappho, a noble woman, a wife, a mother, he goes on and on. Willemowitz is an exemplum of the flawed approach of measuring ancient morality by contemporary standards with the idea that marriage, motherhood, and being quote unquote noble are incompatible with homoeroticism. He implicitly argues for a direct correlation between moral uprightness and sexual behavior, especially for women. This impassioned defense is aimed at a French pseudo-historical text entitled The Songs of Philitis, which title Filimovitz uses for this chapter of his book. 
Uh, in fact, this chapter is a reprint of Villamovitz's review of the Songs of Belitis from years earlier. Now, this book, The Songs of Belitis by Pierre Louis, was first published in 1894 and represents the poems of a fictional ancient woman named Belitis who lived on Lesbos with Sappho and the other lesbian women. Here is a sample from one poem entitled Sappho. Uh, to what country have I come? What isle is this where love is comprehended in this fashion? This is a, a rather tame excerpt, so you get the idea. Uh, the poems are presented as real translations of ancient papyri, but the contemporary audience seems to have understand it as understood it as parody. It was nevertheless a very serious matter to Villamovitz. But even while he identifies Louis's book as a threat to Sappho's reputation, Villamovitz downplays the extent of her homoerotic associations. When he says, and now Sappho, we are led to think that Louis' fiction is a scandalous intruder in a long line of respectful takes on Sappho's poems, and that the suggestion of homoeroticism is not only recent, but confined to a single blatantly ridiculous book. In fact, Villamovitz belongs to a long line of self-appointed defenders of Sappho. His Sappho on Simonides is dedicated to Friedrich Gottlieb Welker, who 100 years prior published the influential Sappho freed from a reigning prejudice. Uh, in this work, Belker argues that Sappho must in fact have been chaste. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the Greeks would not have allowed her to become famous and admired. He generally avoids terms relating to sex and sexuality, but euphemistically refers to homoeroticism as a terrible and abominable thing. Mm -hmm. Following his forebears, Villa mm -hmm. broadcast the party line that Sappho was a model of chastity and that she addressed girls in her poetry because she was simply a doting teacher of music poetry and religious worship. This latter idea, that Sappho was a teacher, is actually still popular, though it's increasingly recognized that in the extant fragment, Sappho never identifies herself as a teacher or her beloved to students. Louis' book was, in this way, doubly offensive to Villamovitz since he distorts the pedagogical argument and makes Sappho a teacher indeed, a teacher of Sapphic delights. Offensive though this undoubtedly was to Villamovitz, he seems to have chosen Louis' book because it was an easy target. Despite his apparent urgency to defend Sappho, Villamovitz completely ignores the more scholarly contribution of a 1903 text and translation by René Vivienne, a British uh, expat living in Paris. Vivienne's book, entitled Sappho, included the Greek text, a literal prose translation, and then a creative poetic interpretation. Vivienne was wealthy and educated, but of course she was a woman and not a member of the academy, so Vilmovitz did not feel obliged to acknowledge her. It's also been suggested that Vilmovitz chose not to engage with Vivienne's work out of a fear of spreading her message, since her homoerotic Sappho is paired with and arguably supported by the Greek text itself. Louis made an easier target, while Vivienne's much more reputable take was not addressed. Others have connected Vilmovitz ignoring Vivienne with his notorious misogyny, evident throughout Sappho and Simonides. For example, at a certain point, he refutes Horace's epithet for Sappho, mascula, and insists that Sappho would not have been a suffragette. Mascula is an epithet used by Horace in Epistle 119 in a discussion of poetic inheritance. It means masculine. What strikes me in this statement is not just the vehement anti-feminism, but also Villamovitz's rather casual reputation of Horace. If Louis was an easy target, Horace is much less so, and the invocation of the epithet mascula gives away the ruse. Sappho's atypical eroticism was part of her reputation long before Belitis was invented. One aspect of Vivian's book that may have lent it a troubling degree of credence was the pairing of the Greek with literal French translations. In a poem like Fragment 1, known as the Ode to Aphrodite, the Greek indicates, and Vivian's French reflects, a female Sappho and a female beloved. The official line from the pro-chastity camp was split on this poem. Some insisted on a textual corruption and bracketed the offending feminine endings, while others acknowledged the female beloved, but insisted that there was nothing erotic about it. In either case, Sappho's uh, connection with homoeroticism is, uh, or Sappho's incompatibility with homoeroticism is a self-evident assumption. There is something very frustrating about the way that scholars at this time hoarded Sappho's biographical details. There was the idea that they, as highly educated scholars, were the only ones with the authority to conjecture about her identity. But of course, they were also gatekeepers, and no one who would venture to expand the possibilities of Sappho's biography were allowed to become authorities on the subject. 
Vivian and other Sappho fans of the era took the trouble to study Greek and read Sappho in her own words, but no amount of self-taught expertise would grant them legitimacy in the eyes of Dilimovitz. The connection between words connoting female homosexuality and vocabulary adapted from Sappho's name has been an undercurrent so far in my paper, and it merits a closer look. Considering the influential social circle of Vivienne and her friends in the late 19th century Paris, it is no surprise that the terms for female homosexuality that are connected with Sappho, uh, which are Sapphism and lesbian, originated and were popularized in French before spreading to English and elsewhere. Homosexual, originally a German term, became associated with the early psychologist movement and is wrapped up in ideas of diagnoses. These words became very popular, offering an identity to people who had long been searching for one. For many, the comfort and community inherent in this identity was worth bearing the brand of illness, which would not be shed by the psychological world until the 1970s. Vilimovitz and his life were reacting to something here that they could not control. The very words for female homosexuality were evolved from Sappho's name. In Vilimovitz's lifetime, women were making pilgrimages to the island of Lesbos to pay her tribute. In subsequent decades, the popular connection between lesbianism and the lesbian poet only grew as influential authors and poets like Virginia Woolf, H.D., and Ezra Pound used her name as a byword for female homoeroticism. But Vilimovitz was influential. The stronger the associations in popular culture became, the more scholars dug in their heels. In the years and decades following Vilimovitz's book, Sappho scholarship ranged from ambivalence and reluctance to address the issue of homoeroticism to vehement defenses of chastity. In the latter camp is David M. Robinson's 1924 monograph, Sappho and Her Influence. About Sappho's reputation, he says, it is against the nature of things that a woman who has given herself up to unnatural and inordinate practices, which defy the moral instinct and throw the soul into disorder, practices which harden and petrify the soul, should be able to write in perfect obedience to the laws of vocal harmony, imaginative portrayal, and arrangement of the details of thought. <laughs> we all know what he means by unnatural and inordinate practices. Drawing a sharp line between talent and moral baseness, Robinson makes sweeping generalizations about the nature of womankind. This assessment of the nature of women is particularly stunning coming from someone who not only is not a woman, but who I'm not sure has ever met one. <laughs> but popular culture is relentless. Sappho and even the fictional Bolitis continue to be received and celebrated by the communities who needed them. And eventually, classic scholars realized that the popular notion of a lesbian Sappho was no threat to them. So in Dennis Page's 1955 commentary, he states plainly that Philomovitz's theory was based not in fact, but in ideology. Not long after that, in 1958, Mary Barnard published her translation of the Sappho Fragments, which was praised for its faithfulness to the Greek. This started a trend as David Campbell's 1982 translation and then Anne Carson's in 2002 uh, strive even more to present Sappho on her own terms. So, uh, Carson states in her preface, it seems that she, Sappho, knew and loved women as deeply as she did music. Can we leave the matter there? It is now second nature to us to separate the poems from the poet. The old approach of leveraging a biography out of Sappho's meager fra fragments has proven untenable, with Vilimovitz and Vivienne failing in equal measure on this front. The commentaries, critical editions, and translations from the last several decades reflect the desire to appreciate the poetry without impassioned speculations about the poet. In my personal life, I'm glad that sapphic speculations granted generations of women like me a sense of identity and community. But as a scholar, I'm perfectly comfortable facing the question of Sappho's sexuality and shrugging my shoulders. We just don't know. But I wonder, when we teach Sappho, how much of this scholarly history are we obligated to report on? How do we right the wrong of the gatekeeping censors who held out for so long against the homoeroticism plainly expressed in the fragments? Is it enough that I'm giving this talk? This is the question that I pose to the group. What do we do with our thorny scholarly inheritance? Here's some further me. Thank you. So uh, we were thinking when we were talking earlier that we really would like it to be more of a conversation than a Q and A because we feel like we don't think. So we pose some <laughs> questions, um, but maybe we can uh, have a bit of a conversation if anyone has thoughts or reactions. So 
I'll make a comment. Go ahead. No, I was going to comment as a secondary mm -hmm. teacher that one area that has changed so, in, um, for example, until at least 15 years ago, much of the time, the only way to access some of these texts, like the satirica mm -hmm. is a great example, you really can only get it either in, you know, a, a Tobner mm -hmm. or an adapted reader, read, I mean, really, in some fashion. And so with the widespread availability of the texts, whether it's Latin library or PHI or some of these other places, that you can, uh, you know, the teachers can access them, but there's, in the challenge is still though, if you're using, if you're finding it, like using them, nothing's been touched about the text. Mm -hmm. You're still, you know, you're creating materials for your students. So mm -hmm. time, you know, time's the, uh, that. But I do say, I do think that it then allows what the original text is. Um, it's not really an answer, but it's sort of a comment on it. Like, there was a time when the millionaires and everybody was just about the only available text, and that's not, True without some work uh, that you still put into it. It's not just true. I just want to add on to that yeah. as also a secondary teacher that what I'm learning is that there are people creating amazing resources for the texts that aren't conventionally in the curriculum, mm -hmm. and it's so easy for teachers and, and, and administrators in schools to say we should read Cicero, Caesar, Virgil, and Ovid because it's what we've always read and we're connecting them to that. Tradition and, and that's what the default is. And if we as teachers don't think critically about what text we're putting in front of our students, then we're doing them a huge disservice. Um, and I went to a talk yesterday about LGBT means SPQR.com. And I just think the more we can share those resources and those lesson plans, and if you create a commentary for a text for your students that wasn't available, we can share that with each other and have access to that, that, that can change a lot. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. I just learned about that yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely going to look into that website more. I saw a hand over there. Yeah, I too am in the secondary sector. And, and um, I started my career with the bombs, Millionaire's Dinner Party, having been a, a product of the 70s trained Latin dream myself, <laughs> and made the fatal mistake of showing the entire Latin department at my school my first year, 23 years old. The satirical movie, mm -hmm. um, which went on and on and on for about four hours, and I really thought I lost my job <laughs> that night. Um, but I today I feel like I'm being pulled in two very different directions that are contradictory mm -hmm. because um, I, you know, we teach kids who are going off to college in a year or so who who are very much uh, either forming or who have formed their sexual identities mm -hmm. and they are hungry mm -hmm. for affirmation in the material that they're reading in our classes. Um, but if you were watching the news and seeing what's going on in independent schools and my school in particular, where you know dozens of former faculty and current faculty are losing their jobs because of crossing certain boundaries mm -hmm. with students. Um, and so I find that um, it, it really takes a lot of delicacy, and I'm really glad you mentioned um, Catullus 50 because I think that's a great example of a piece which you can gently tease out and be fairly explicit without, I think, stepping mm -hmm. on parents' toes. Because of course, what we say in the classroom now, you know, gets piped out into all sorts of directions and can be misconstrued. And so. I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't, I'm just saying mm -hmm. it's very challenging, but in a good way. It's just a different time we're living in teaching secondary school. On that point, I mean, that's a point that I'm very interested in because um, the talk that I just gave is a modified version of a talk uh, from a session that Miriam and I did last year. Um, and the original version of this talk was titled um, Gay Reception of Petronius in the Me Too Era. Um, because we're sort of, I was working through this question of, um, there is this reception history of Petronius, but so much of the sexual content of it is violent. Um, and so there is this sort of problematic um, interplay between the desire to not omit things that are relevant to students or speak to students while at the same time um, 
the the reception itself is problematic. Um, and that's an interesting sort of response, I guess, to your comment. Yeah. Greg. Uh, well, in, uh, I used to, when I first started the curriculum, I inherited top of the, the Cambridge Latin course, which is super popular. Uh, and it has some good qualities, uh, but more and more, as I learned more of all sorts of these issues of looking at it, you know, I moved away from it a while ago for mostly for pedagogical reasons, but now I try to look at some of the content issues. And so there's a whole chapter that's actually based on Tramalfio's dinner, but then has been sort of transported. But the exact same thing appears, the, the sort of the sexual harassment of the woman, etc., is present. They've obviously they've removed any sort of homosexual content or, or hint thereof, um, but they have no problem keeping all of the and this is true throughout Cambridge. Mm -hmm. I mean, in fact, like now having read in the last few years with new eyes, it's like, oh my god, like almost every chapter there's some issue of, of that. So uh, it's not even just in the readers, but then in the textbooks that are made that are designed to help you then read the readers, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's like it's a whole industry. So uh, that's that's all. Yeah, I see a hand in the back. Um, is there any, you guys have any thoughts about the Twitter phenomenon, Sacklebot? Oh, I love Sacklebot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Sacklebot is a delight. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, <laughs> just, just a good way to describe what Sacklebot is. Uh, Sacklebot is a bot, uh, a bot Twitter account that tweets out uh, fragments of the Sappho fragments. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how it decides on, on length. Uh, they're from the Carson translation, I believe. And it's, it's interesting because you might think that fragmenting what is already fragmentary would just sort of chop it up and make it incomprehensible. But in fact, in little, little doses like that, it's, it's almost even more powerful. It's mm -hmm. even just individual words. It's really striking, um, including a, sort of a spacing and a bracketing that the, that the papyri leaves for us. Uh, so I recommend following Sampa about if you're not. You know what, like, I, I wonder if the, 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 the fragmented fragments allow you to like, because it is so cut up, you can write your own meaning into it. Like, exactly. To borrow another problematic queer writer, you know, William S. Burroughs cut up, you're reading it and whatever, um, whatever meaning you bring into it is what you get out of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, and I of course applaud that, that sort of thing. I think it's, what I love about Sappho Bot, besides what I've already said, is that it's making Sappho available to people who might never have heard of her otherwise. Right. And it's right out there on the Twitterverse. It's not like you have to advance to a certain level of reading ancient Greek to, to learn who Sappho is, and I love that. But I wonder if like the, the awareness or popularity of Sappho is entirely because of her association with, with the word lesbian, right? Versus, you know, 100, 200 years ago, when Germans were like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's it. There are so few uh, things like this, I think, in the in the world of, of female homoeroticism. I think yeah. that's why, for, for centuries, you see uh, women celebrating Sappho in particular in this way, um, because there are just so few examples to, to rally behind. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if either of you have thoughts about how so because I, I love to start to bring in like real life Greek and bring it into my classes. Um, but it is, I, I have struggled, I mean, partly just the dialogue for Sappho is very hard for beginning Greek students. Um, but also because there's so much context around, like, it, you know, if you want to bring, like, these are great texts, and I'd love for my students to see kind of the richness and all the different perspectives and the things they don't feel like that not the same kind of foreign, like Xenophon's marching a lot. Um, but, <laughs> At the same, like I, I feel like to do it well and to get into issues of you know consent and violence and it ends up it, it is very hard to excerpt in a way that isn't like three class sessions to, to contextualize that. I'm just wondering if um, either if this comes up, I think more with Petronius than with Sappho, um, but how if if you do want to excerpt, um, how to do that? responsibly with students and then the class maybe isn't about mm. sexuality um the class is about learning some grammar <laughs> um do you have thoughts about ways to, to position these things or anyone 
you want to take that or do you want me to? Um, I think we should both comment, okay. but yeah. I have. I have a response. So um, it's true, Sappho is not in, uh, in the Attic dialect, and that's been sort of this self-fulfilling uh, prophecy where people study the language less because, or that dialect less because there's less of it, and then uh, it disappears more and more because people don't study it, uh, which is a shame. But I would say that I'm personally uh, really grateful for all the great Sappho translations we have available now. And uh, I teach a TA for a class called the Ancient Greek Hero every fall. and uh, we read the Iliad and the Odyssey, but uh, my professor Greg Nagy insists on everyone reading Sappho 31 as well. And so we have a whole class period devoted to Sappho 31 and understanding the dynamics of that poem. And I, I tell them this is a woman singing about her, her love for another woman, and you can take that as you will. Um, so knowledge of the dialect doesn't even enter into it in that way. And for the most part, like you mentioned in the back, people already have these associations and they're curious about it and they want to know more. So that, that allows for a for a stage to sort of go into it. Yeah, so so this is the question that I don't have an answer to. <laughs> <laughs> um, Specifically why we didn't want to teach you an answer. No, but I do have thoughts. Um, and the first thought is like when Miriam and I did the earlier version of this presentation last year, um, one of the senior faculty members in the room um, in the sort of discussion afterwards said, um, that, well, one way that he does this is he just tries as often as possible to teach classes that are author-based and read the whole author. Um, that's a luxury that you can have when you have control of your curriculum and when you're teaching advanced classes. Um, where, um, like if I'm teaching Latin one or Greek one, I don't have that luxury because the students are not ready to read everything that an author has written. Um, the, the second thought um, and this is something that really comes out to me when I read Petronius and read different reactions to Petronius is that we start getting like really different texts. There's like Petronius, the like object of scholarly study. And that's actually like a different text almost than Petronius um, that gets like commented on by people on Goodreads. Um, it's not that they're, I mean, they might be reading the same translation but they're approaching it in very different ways. And so one of the things that I've been trying to do in my classes is really think about ways in which I can take off the philological filter and teach in the class using a receptive approach. Um, but that runs into the problem of, of course, as I said, I'm limited by my own experience, right? So like the receptive approaches that like appear obvious to me might not be actually the ones that my students need in that moment of their lives. Um, and that is the sort of, where I don't have an answer. Okay. I feel like teaching, I, sorry, I'm just, the, the, the response that this, your professor made was interesting because teaching, I mean, it's like a text, like a full text author seminar is sort of like the default, like seminar you had in graduate school, right? Like mm -hmm. Cicero de Filippos or something. But that is still like a selection. Mm -hmm. It's a selection to read like this part of this author. And in a way, if you're like not, actually sort of excerpting parts from this one corpus, you, you, it's like a cop-out. You don't need to justify to your students mm -hmm. why we're reading sort of this part of like this author's corpus. I just wanted to like say that in response right. to that. Like even like Sappho, it's like you can't read all of Sappho. That is still a, a I don't know. Mm -hmm. And like Sappho is sort of like what you're saying. Mean, she's like really produced by her readers, by people who are like identifying with her and filling in the lacunae. And like that means like seems like there's like an ethical imperative to teach that alongside with Sappho. Because yeah, we don't know if Sappho was queer, but like these people like are making her queer and that's empowering. And like I wish that I had like had that as like a younger person. Um, so I don't know. That, that's what I would say. Greg, do you have a to, uh, <laughs> uh, well yeah, so obviously any act of selection, right, is is a is an act of selection. I think one of the differences with like the ball readers, etc., is um, there's a Wizard of Oz element to it where they, they're not letting you see behind the curtain. They're not telling you, oh, here's what I selected, here's why I selected, etc. So one thing I, I do try to do constantly is tell my students, okay, we're reading this. Here's why I chose it. That doesn't have to be the reason that 
you know, you and I, and I do try to, and I, again, I have the luxury of being the only teacher in my school, and I have four years with them, and so by the time they're seniors, I can have dialogues with them about what types of things they would like to read, et cetera, and it can be a negotiation, et cetera, um, which is obviously different from the model that most people have. Um, but one thing that I think is, is happening a lot more, and I'd like that it's happening, is that we're just open with them about, like, look, like, I chose this text because I do, you know, queer classics reception, and I thought this would be a great way to get at it. Um, you know, I hope that you guys find this interesting as well, but also I hope that you find your own things to interest in, and that you teach me stuff about it and, and what, what it says to you. Don't let my reception be the only one in the class, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, so I don't know. Again, like, well, like as you said, right, with, like depending on what position you're in, whether you have that luxury or not, um, I think it's still fine to do selection, like, mm -hmm. but let's just talk about how and why. So. Yeah, I, I just wanted to share a personal anecdote. The, the same line teacher I had in high school had us reading things like Lucretius, we also read Catullus, and it wasn't until a few years ago, so I, this is back in the 90s when I was reading Catullus, but it wasn't until maybe about 10 years ago that I realized, oh, those poems about the sparrow are not maybe just about that. <laughs> 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 Much less that could also get poems about men also. Mm -hmm. That just didn't exist. Like, mm -hmm. It was so desexualized. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you bring that up. <laughs> the first time we gave a, a version of this talk, this tandem talk, um, I split my time between Catullus's poems to Juventus and yeah. to Sappho. Um, and I, I ended up narrowing it down to Sappho because it's just so much content. But uh, yes. That's wonderful. I, I, <laughs> I'm glad to say that in my undergraduate course on, on Catullus, we, we gave uh, a, a fair amount of time to the Juventus poems as well as to the lesbian poems. Uh, but there's definitely uh, a lot of censorship in the history of reception among mm -hmm. scholars as well. I mean, people translating Juventus as a girl, like all sorts of, I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, we read Catullus 50, and it's like, God, these guys just love poetry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I love it. Yeah. It was a creative kind of friend. Creative yeah, activity <laughs> with a close friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I just want to say, I love what you've done. Um, and it's, there's, there's a lot of, so I, I first and foremost, I really was a dirty medievalist. And there's a lot of, there's and has been going on for a while in medieval history, especially medieval, French medieval historians, about the history of the history of the history of texts, you know, mm -hmm. and how they get written about. And it's like such a fruitful field, and like um, it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately when we're talking about all these issues about how our field is conceived and what qualifies as commerce scholarship. But when you go back in and look at it, um, all the troubling stuff you see. And I think, you know, because in some corners people say, well, maybe we need to get away from the languages at all. And just have but the problem that you run into there is then, well, what are we going to be reading? We're going to be reading these sexist, racist, homophobic translations that were made in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. If you don't have anyone new coming up who can provide a Translation. Mm -hmm. That would help a lot there. Yeah. Yeah, even this, this most recent translation of the Odyssey, right? It's a marked difference. I forget the name of the Emily Wilson. Wilson. Emily Wilson, right? Emily yeah. Wilson. But it's such a dramatic difference, right? Yeah. Uh, that shows you, like, you can always retranslate um, and make things better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Just to make a quick point, I wasn't turning around. <laughs> but, um, about the history of the history. Of the history uh, that I, I love that Edelon has started doing because like, yes. there's a uh, I say to my students we uh, we read Sappho that like here so because like these were questions they were shocked to hear that these are things that people have thought were like that people still alive today have argued that Sappho was a man because of what we couldn't write like that and um, you know that having some of those things where like we don't have to do all of the work ourselves I, I like that there's there are more venues for people to do the history of the scholarship so that then I can just 
so nice to meet something and I don't have to go like, let me find quotes from all the good scholarship about this topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. We love that one. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I wrote, I wrote a, a, a version of this paper for, for Idaho. Great. Any last comments? I think we have like five minutes left. I just want to say that I really love this because in a lot of ways, this is exactly what this entire weekend is about. Mm -hmm. How do we choose what texts we read and who we talk about? Why do we make the decisions that we do? Why do we omit the people that we omit? And not just in issues of sexuality, but also. Who are we reading? Why did we pick this? Exactly. It's very easy to fall into a trap of, of choosing authors and interpretations that, that look like you. And that's always mm -hmm. been the problem with classical scholarship. So people have always looked one way. And I think it's starting to change. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we're here. Version you take where you already own because you're in the street. There's that issue as well. Yeah. We had a hand for the back there and then one in the front here. Um, I know you didn't want it to be a question, but I can have a question. <laughs> I'll direct it at everybody. Um, I teach at the middle school level, and I, I also I give the autonomy to pick which text I use, and I would love to be able to incorporate texts that where the main characters aren't a rich Roman family, mm. like maybe some more diverse characters that deal with pretty diverse group of students, but I'm not entirely sure where the best places to look. I mean, I know about some of the more widely published of the little novellas that are out there if anyone had any mm -hmm. tips. Well I, I I'm in the middle of well I haven't had convincing by because the school my school's totally behind it, but we're switching to a new textbook called Subarani. Mm -hmm. Um and uh even artwork and it's incredibly like it represents what the Romans look like, not like they were, you know, second school trying to be little. To be totally honest, I mean, I, and I say that as someone who looks like I do. And um, yeah, people of all different skin tones, they look different, and, you know, there's lots of difference. And it's set in the Sabura, so they're also not, um, you know, it's not as, you know, it's not uh, Caecilius or the Hormuleans that I do want to hear. But so it's, so it's that. Um, that. That's where I'm actually starting. With some of the students that were really the first seventh grade class this year, and I want my students to see themselves. So, as far as the textbook goes, just one song. Sorry? Yeah. Request it. We had a comment up here in the front. I just a question. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious of the course you were describing where you talk, where you read um, sample 31 with the Iliad the Odyssey. Um, could you just talk about maybe what the, the commonality is? Is it talking about you know America versus mm -hmm. Al love? Exactly. So the, the class kind of tries to be uh, but to specifically a look at uh, heroes, but also it tries to give a sort of holistic view of Greek culture uh, as well as we can in one semester. So that week is uh, looking at the different depictions of men and women in Homeric epic. Um, and then from there, taking different uh, genres that are associated with men and women. So whereas epic is, is a more masculine genre uh, performed by uh, Homer, we have uh, also this more feminine affiliated genre uh, of lyric, uh, which who, who is uh, you know, emblematic poet is, is Sappho among, among a bunch of men. Uh, but this is taught as we look at uh, the laments of Andromache mm -hmm. uh, and a few other uh, female-led laments in the Iliad, the Odyssey, to sort of talk about what what were women's roles if this is women's poetry. Mm -hmm. um, and the professor really tries to have uh, as as much sort of representation of different uh, different kinds of of poetry, different genres, different kinds of people um, as possible. That's why why I like teaching that class. And speaking of Andromache, does anyone know when Columbia and Harvard is, is performing it? Because I've been trying to find that online. I know it's, yeah, it's April. Uh, it, one moment. <laughs> Calendar. Um, it's going to be April 3rd and 4th, I think. Tickets have gone on. No. Yeah. But. 
Okay, I think, Kat, this is the time we're supposed yeah, to end, right? Okay.